This is a portrait of my husband David and it's 123 centimetres by 137 centimetres. After doing my daughters, I made quite a lot of notes about how I actually did it and moved on to my husband. I took a series of photographs of my husband and then when I'd chosen one I used that one to make some drawings. From the photograph I squared up a large piece of spot and cross paper and did a drawing of what I roughly thought I was going to do and this is drawn out not as a drawing but as a line drawing ready for tracing onto silk and then painting into. On the bottom I designed a rough idea for what the rug would be but it changes all the time and even though I'd done these drawings it doesn't mean that the final thing would end up that way. And you can see I changed my mind quite a few times when I was drawing of what I was actually doing there. The frame that I had was only big enough to do half the painting at one time on silk. And also if it's much too big then you just can't reach over to the centre to paint it easily. So this is only the first half and the line you can see at the bottom is where I'm going to join it to the other half. Here's the two halves sewn together, top and bottom, and then it's been backed onto some felt so that it's ready to work with, with machine embroidery. It was much easier doing my husband. He's very easy going. He just let me take the photographs and let me get on with it and didn't make any specifications or complaints. So that made it nice and easy to do. Once I got the eyes, nose, mouth and eyebrows in by hand, I did a few little hand lines of where some of the lines were going to be. Gradually I was able to build up the face with a combination of hand and machine embroidery. I built those lines up by hand and worked into it and did the bases for his hair in machine embroidery as well. And then I did quite a lot of the wrinkles by hand, which I did quite enjoy doing actually. They were very interesting to do. And the hair was started out with machine embroidery. And then I worked into it by hand to give it a more realistic effect. And I added in one or two grey hairs there. As you can see, my husband's going grey in his old age. I quite enjoyed putting those in. I to give the face a three-dimensional effect, I had to build up a sort of skull behind the back with felt. From left to right, you can see the first few pieces of felt and the second picture is the felt on top of those pieces that you can see in the first picture. And the last one has a single piece and some more in the eyes, which then, when sewn around from the front, created a 3D effect. I was quite worried about whether I was going to be able to do that shirt. When I looked at it in the photograph and the drawings, I thought, oops, I've never done anything quite like that. Each colour has five different colours and the stripes are created by using the highlights and the lowlights in the waves to accentuate the fact that it looks rumpled. I was probably changing the threads about every 30 seconds to create that wavy effect. I still find hands really hard to do. It's very difficult with machine embroidery to get them to look realistic. The shoes were quite an interesting thing to do. I've never done shoes before, especially not a sole like that. And uh, it, it was really like everything else. You just have to look exactly what you're looking at and uh, do what you see, not what you think you see. And gradually, step by step, it turns out to be what you want it to be. Thought you might like to see a detail of the shoe being worked. You can see here where I work with my highlights and lowlights to start with and added in a tiny bit of gold where the laces are coming through. The denim effect on the jeans is created exactly the same way as it was on the portrait of the girls. This is a detail of the jeans being worked. You can see here where I'm crisscrossing different colour threads to create the effect of denim. I wasn't happy with the folds in the jeans, so I decided to work into that by hand and change the highlight. As you can imagine, at this stage it was very thick and there was no way I was going to be able to get the machine back into that. So I had to weave through the top as if I was darning and highlight that way. Another detail of me hand sewing into it. I also gave the knee a more worn look using the same techniques. 
David objected quite strongly to this pink chair. He thought it looked far too small and wasn't a good chair to be having a portrait done in. But it was the only chair the right size that I could get into the room and set up that was in a room where there was enough light to get a good photograph. So this is the chair we used with a few changes. As you can see, it's built up with free machine embroidery and uh, just paying attention to all the different shades and keeping my lines coming as if it was in perspective, gradually drawing your eye back into the darker colour to give the feel of the idea that you are looking into the back of the chair. My husband's writing a book and he did envis envisage at one point that this was what the cover would roughly look like. They're not flying carrots, that's meant to be fire. So when I did it, I very carefully embroidered the name of the book, Intimate as a Shadow, on the cover of the book. And it had a lovely curl to it, so the page looked like it was curling. But when I looked at it afterwards, I realised I'd spelt it wrong. So I had to unpick it all and put it back in again, but I could never get back the curve that I had originally. And this was an ideal space, of course, to sign it as well. So I've signed it on the spine of the cover. I did say when I'd done the portrait of the girls that I wouldn't use a wood effect again, but it is extremely useful to draw your eyes back. And so I did use it again, but I made it much easier for myself because I drew in a fun rug with lots of lovely colours to work on. Um, here I'm about to move down to the rug area, which is a play area, and I haven't really decided exactly what I want to do. And with these bits, I just work and see what happens and have a lot of fun, really. And it's really important to have fun bits to work on when you're working on a piece of work that's as big as this, because it's very intense when you're trying to get things accurate and correct. I don't always know what I'm doing in these areas and I like to leave it like that because sometimes when you just leave it to create as you go along, it's much better. There can be disasters and sometimes it doesn't work out how you want it to be. At this stage, after all the work that I've done, I was really unhappy with those legs, the legs on the chairs and the tables. It's when you do so much embroidery, things get pulled out of shape no matter how hard you try. And I didn't feel I could leave this work like this, so I had to work out a way to change. I've traced over the leg with a piece of tracing paper, making a strong pencil outline. I've boxed it in with a highlighter around the tracing with another colour, marking out the different places, the centre of it and the cross lines are between the bits of carving. This is probably a bit clearer for you to see. This is the bit from the chair leg where I've got the original drawing that's been traced and I've boxed it into straight lines using a red line so I can see clearly how I'm going to get that straight. And I've done a drawing over that fitting in the shape that I want it to finally be. I've traced that tracing onto a piece of Swedish tracing paper which is very soft and you can sew through it. And I've tacked this, I've done a, a, a sharp line, a strong dark line, so you can't miss it. And I've then tacked this on top of the original leg. Then I machine sewed over my line drawing. And I've also done a little light line um, in the center where I want my highlights to be. I tore away the Swedish tracing paper. This then left me with the leg as it was, but I have a line now around that. And this is my new line that I'm going to work over it to straighten the whole thing up. And this is the chair leg. Here you can see the drawn out line on the Swedish paper. It's been stitched around and is now being torn away. I've now got my new outline to work around. I won't have so much detail in this one, which is a shame, but it just didn't work. And I've got a line drawing down the centre of chalk, and this is to make sure I know where my centre is. And there's my finished chair leg. Not as ornate as it, I would like it to have been, but it does look a lot better than it did. I did have a lot of trouble with the legs of the chairs and the tables. It was very, very difficult to keep the legs straight, so they, they never were quite what I wanted them to be. With the background, I, I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. I started off by drawing out rough paisley shapes that I just gradually built. 
It, it ended up being quite organic and, and becoming like a plant. So I put a root in the bottom there to make this plant look as though it's growing. As I developed it, it gradually became to me his imagination talking to him. So it's actually an imagination plant. And often when I just leave things to just grow and develop, sometimes the best ideas come. I think it's important to make sure that a textile is not like a painting. I think if I did all of this in painting, mixing all these different colours, it would be very garish. And the thing about a textile is that it, you can mix lovely vibrant colours and adding a tiny bit of gold just adds a little bit of luxury. To finish, I padded out the back of David with some felt and that was to help give a three-dimensional quality. And a second layer was put behind that so that some areas would stand out more than others.